यहाँ से स्टॉप करेंगे और फिर वो खुद ही कुछ So last week we ended on the the story of or the idea of bitter walidain bin righteousness respect and honoring the parents as it relates to the body and we ended with a discussion about uh ended with a discussion about bitter walidain as it relates to the heart so that's another the area that's very important for us that even if we have outward respect and honoring of our parents that we also have to work on and make sure that our respect in our hearts is also there and that we're not harboring any anger any hate any resentment any um, uh, arrogance towards our parents because even if we maintain the outward we have to purify the inward as well same thing with the prayer outwardly we may be able to have a prayer that fully has wudu we're, we're 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 doing everything that we should be doing about the prayer but then we're thinking about our family we're thinking about our bills we're thinking about our work whereas we should be thinking about the prayer and focusing on the prayer so outwardly we might have this adherence to the to the to the sunnah of the action the action of that but in we also have to work on the inward and a very famous example of this is the famous hadith of indam al a'malu bin niyat verily actions are by their intentions now this is a this is a hadith that everybody knows and they say it often and as i mentioned one of the ulama said that if you broke islam down to four hadith this hadith would be one of them verily actions are by intentions in fact you may have had a, a, a an interaction with a scholar or a teacher when you ask them a question and they say what was your intention right uh, or if you study the the chapters of fiqh for wudu for prayer for fasting for hajj intention 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 and you go into what what is the intention so it's very important to know what what the intention of the person is the beginning of that hadith is what what did the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say or actually the, the not the beginning the the story of that of that hadith what is the story? The Hijrah. <coughs> exactly. Exactly. A man migrated from, he made Hijrah from Mecca to Medina just to marry a woman. And so when the Prophet ﷺ heard about this, he didn't make a public denouncement of the person. And this is another thing to, to, to notice how the Prophet ﷺ, how he addressed issues that he heard about. He just said, <laughs> Verily actions are by intention. And then he said, whoever's hijrah was for Allah and His Messenger, then his hijrah is for Allah and His Messenger. Meaning, that's the reward that you get. And whoever's uh, hijrah was <laughs> for a woman to marry her or to, to get some sort of dunya, <laughs> that his hijrah is based on what he made hijrah. Because hijrah is a, is a very big thing. It's a, it's a, it's a sacred act for a person to say, I'm going to leave my family, leave my culture, leave my business, leave what I know, leave the people that I know. Even though Mecca and Medina are only a few hundred miles apart, they were different, and they were both Arabs. They had different cultures. They had different uh, ideals. They had different, even their, 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 their basis of what they, uh, their economy. So what was the Meccan economy based around? Trade. What's that? Trade. Trade. They were to job. And what was the Medinan uh, uh, economy based around? Agriculture. Agriculture. And so even if you look at farming societies as opposed to mercantile societies, it creates different cultures. Um, or even uh, farming societies as opposed to farming societies as opposed to uh, livestock societies as well. Without getting into uh, th those details, it's a big thing and it's a, it's a sacrifice people make to go uh, on, on hijrah, to make a hijrah, just to drop things. Sometimes people, how many people have known families who have actually left their jobs, left their house, and moved to another place to be around a stronger Muslim community, a more active Muslim community? Or have taken their kids, they said, you know what, I want my kids in an Islamic school and I can't find one in my area, so I will, I'm gonna move across the country. 
I'm going to forego opportunities. I'm going to take a, a, a pay cut. I'm going to make all of these sacrifices. I'm going to make hijrah from this place to this place over here for the sake of Allah. I know one family for the hijrah of their son, they moved about three or four times. And so now people, they can pray behind the, the person and they're like, oh, mashallah, he's a prophet of the Quran. But do they know the hijrah and the sacrifice that the family that he made? Another point about hijrah, sometimes when you think about hijrah, is between two countries. Hijrah, the concept of hijrah, is really moving from one place to another for the sake of Allah. So how many of us have been in a situation where two people are having a conversation and we feel, okay, there's some backbiting, there's some lying going on here, there's some arrogance in the conversation, whatever it might be, and we, and we can't stop it, and so we actually just say, you know what, sorry, I have to go. We've had those instances. Or there's, uh, you go to uh, an event or a, a, a gathering and something about it doesn't, doesn't sit well with you and you leave. Each of those instances are a type of hijrah. It's a type of hijrah where you're going. You might go from one room to another room. It might be as simple as that. You might be in a house and some of your family members are engaging in hiba of people and you can't make a change in that, and so you say, you know what, I don't want to be in this room with them, I'm going just to go into the other room. Or I'm going to leave early. That right there is an action of hijrah. And so don't look at hijrah as, as this big uh, immigration, which that is sometimes what happens, and leaving the family. It's any movement from one place to another for the sake of Allah. The first muhajir for the sake of Allah was, who was the first person who did this? He made hijrah for the sake of Allah, for his deen. Inni muhajirun in Allah. Ibrahim alayhi salam, jazakallah khair. Was the, our, the, our, uh, our father Ibrahim alayhi salam was the first person who made hijrah for the sake of Allah. So, now drawing it back into the discussion, whoever, what, we, people move around and leave situations for other reasons. They could leave it for a dunya reason. They might be trying to, and outwardly, the action looks exactly the same. Two people praying right next to each other. One person's praying is accepted and the other one is not. Outwardly, it's the same. Inwardly is where, is where the criterion really matters. That's the furqan of, the, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of that action. And so when we talk about respecting parents, then it also has to say, okay, now we have this outward obedience to our parents and this outward uh, honoring of our parents but now let's look inward first of all are we doing it for the sake of Allah or are we doing it for the sake of something else our culture are we doing it for the sake of a nefsi some, a selfish reason we really have to analyze our, our, our actions one time I was with a, uh, with a scholar and he was a very generous scholar in fact a lot of times people would bring him things and he would give it away and he learned it from our main teacher, Murabat al-Hajj, who literally, sometimes people would bring him a gift, a cash gift, to honor him, just say this is you know, a cash gift, and then he, somebody else was coming and saying, I, I need something, he would literally just take that gift and give it right away. I've witnessed this myself with another one of my shiuf, uh, Murabat Muhammad Zain. Somebody brought him 150,000 alqiyah, which was about the equivalent of $500. And in the middle of the Saharan Desert, that's a lot of money, because it, the economy is very weak there, it's a very poor nation. I literally, wallahi, I saw him, somebody came and said, this is a gift somebody has sent to you, and he put it down. Within just a few minutes, somebody came and said, I have a debt. He said, how much is your debt? He said, about 100,000 alqiyya, so about two thirds of that. He counted it out and gave it to him, right away. Just as it comes in, it's, it's being distributed. That's how the generous people are. So this other chef, he was trying to imitate that. He was trying to imitate the, 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 the elder teachers who he saw doing that. And so one time he remarked to one of his students, he said, you know, I really, I, one of the things that I love most about this world is to get something so that I can give it away for the sake of Allah. And so the student told him, he said, beware of your nefs, your, yourself, of, of you doing that for the sake of yourself. And so the sheikh actually, he stopped and he started thinking to himself, he said, he analyzed himself, he analyzed his actions and said, am I doing that? Because it feels good, right? There's actually a, a good feeling that you get when you give something to somebody or when you do something nice. So it's not like if a person doesn't believe in Allah that they don't do good actions. The atheists 
do good actions. There's people who are, who are atheists who don't even believe in an akhirah and they do good actions and for whatever reasons that they can come up with. So people can do an outward action, it can outwardly look the same, but the, really, the difference is the, um, the, 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 the niyyah. And this is why some of the scholars, you know, there's a concept called alchemy, which is what? Changing into gold. Changing metals. So that's the alchemists, they were trying to figure out how can we change some, uh, a non-precious metal into a precious metal. So changing uh, lead into gold. And so they had all these, uh, these secrets. And then the Muslims, of course, in their expansion, as the Muslims expanded in the world, they became familiar with all of these other traditions. They, they learned uh, Greek, uh, uh, logic and reasoning and medicine from the Greeks. They learned, they saw that people were doing the alchemists. And so some of the Muslims actually got involved in that to try to figure out, okay, what's the secret recipe to change metals? But then other scholars looked at that and they said, you know what, this is actually a very good metaphor for actions. And they started applying the principles of alchemy to actions, to our actions of ibadah, in just in the sense of how can you take an action and take it from something very normal and, 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 and a non-precious thing and turn it into something special. So, they, what they said is basically it's intention, it's your niyyah. And they said that niyyah is the, the, that, the in Arabic, the, the thing that can change the metal from one thing to another is called iksir. And uh, the elixir, it's the, the word elixir comes from the Arabic word al iksir and alchemy comes from alchemia, which I think is a non-Arab word. It's probably, what is it, Farsi or, what's that? Alchemy, yeah, chemistry comes from alchemia. Um, what's that? Kimya. Kimya, it's kimya. Like uh, Imam Ghazali, who was, who was Persian, he has a book called Kimya i Sa Sa'adat. The alchemy of Sa'adat, of happiness. And this all is through intention and through following the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa the Quran and the sunnah. So they said the intention is iksirul amal. You can go to any action and you actually can change it from something very normal into something beneficial. So for example, they said drinking water. How can we go from drinking water, from just drinking water, to actually making this an act of worship that gets us closer to Allah? Again with Bismillah. You said say Bismillah, you can follow the sunnahs in the process. But that's just a sunnah. You can actually make it a fard action, which has even more reward. How do you make drinking water into a fund? You are fulfilling your body's need. You're fulfilling your body's need. Because isn't preservation of our body, that's a fund? And, and yet we do things to preserve our body all the time. We sleep, we eat, we drink, we clothe ourselves. And we're doing those things just as a matter of fact, it's preserving the body. But we're not getting a reward for them until we, we take a moment to think about, you know what? I need to drink this, a certain amount of water is actually wajib upon me, and I'm going to make that intention, bismillah. Now you are, you are doing a fard action. Same exact thing, but with the intention you change it. Another example is going to the restroom. How do we make that a fard action? You have to relieve yourself, because if you, there's people that die, right? I was actually, there was a sister years ago, she took her shahada, and she had a sick, it's a sickness called divert, divert, um, diverticulitis. Diver, oh, you're the medical professional here, right? Diverticulitis. Um, did I say it right? Diverticulitis. It's the, uh, it's when the, the material in the intestines is not released or it just gets caught up. Is that uh, proper? Well, it's actually an infection of, it's an infection. of the colon. But you can have something called obstipation, which is when you're so constipated that you get perforation of your colon. Oh, perforation of the colon and then it leads to stuff. Okay. So, maintaining a healthy GI tract is part of, of staying alive. Everything that we can do, we can change it by intention. And then what that does to the believer is it puts them in a higher state of consciousness. One of the things that we try to move away from as believers is to move away from a state of ghafla, heedlessness, to a state of yaqva, awareness and wakingness. And the way to do that is to be aware of your actions at every single moment. When we leave the house, we're thinking, oh, what foot do we leave? You know, that's one of the, the, the wisdoms that I benefited from thinking about the sunnahs of, there's a sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for everything, putting on your clothes, taking off your clothes, go, brushing your teeth, going to, everything has a sunnah. And when you're doing that, you're constantly aware of your actions. Uh, and so we go into the state of, of, of being aware. Oh, this is what I wanted to mention. There's a book called Al-Madkhal. 
It's a four volume book by Ibn al Hajj. He wrote the four volumes all about intention, all about just this hadith. And he analyzes everything. He says, how can the um, how can the person who sells spices, how can he implement the sunnah into his profession and actually purify his actions and increase his actions by changing? He talks about the medical profession. How do, how do doctors and people in the medical profession, uh, the, um, um, the people who uh, do affidavits and so forth, what are they called? Notary publics. He talks, about, he talks about every single profession. He talks about every single element of our lives, even to the restroom. He said, you can have over 90 intentions when you're going to the restroom. 90 intentions, he actually lists them out. To the masjid, he lists out 120. How many, how many intentions do we have when we, when we go to the masjid? But the more intentions we have, as an example, he said, when you go to the masjid, one of the intentions you should make, and as an example, I don't know if you can see back there, they have, the boys are doing wrestling. And Ustad Hasib started them out, he actually explained to them that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wrestled, and so, um, you, when you when you do wrestling, you're, you're you're taking care of your health. You're getting healthier. You're you're going to be able to protect yourself, which is part of the, the obligations. You're following the sunnah. He said. So he actually made them say all this stuff. He said, "Okay, now say, I intend for the sake of Allah." And he listed these things out. And he said, "Now when we wrestle, you're getting reward, and it's an action of worship." So you see how the 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 exceed is the intention. The the, the elixir is the intention. So. He lists out 120 for the masjid. One of them, as an example, he says, when you go to the masjid, have some money in your pocket. Because how many times have we met people along the way and we want to give, we want to give sadaqah or we see one of those sadaqah boxes and we reach it, we don't have cash. And now the masjids are, have the swiping machines and so forth, right? But it always makes it a lot easier just to have some ch change or some small cash in your pocket. He said, it, just by putting the cash into your pocket, and carrying that to the masjid, even if you never give it out, now the entire way you're getting reward for that action. He also said, uh, when you go to the masjid, make the intention that you're going to meet your fellow believers and bring happiness to their hearts. And then he mentions a hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that says one of the best things, one of the best obligations that you can do after the fard, after the prayer, is bringing happiness to the heart of a believer. <coughs> is bringing happiness to the heart of a believer. So just making a person smile, making them feel good, that's an action, that's a huge sunnah to fulfill. He said, now when you do that, you're, you, now you're walking to the masjid, even if nobody's in the masjid and you pray by yourself, you got that reward. And he lists out um, more. Maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll look up that book, try to uh, put out the list. Uh, if anybody, maybe I'll ask you, if you can help me, we'll, we'll, we'll translate it and, and share it. It'll be a good exercise, good reminder for myself as well, all of the intentions. And then if there's any app developers in here, Brother Hasid, uh, you know, we can have some sort of app, right? You can just, <laughs> did you make this intention? And they can check them off. So um, so that's a little bit about Iksir al -Aman. Okay, now to get back to the, the subject at hand, which is Bin al name. So now very important, concept to know about and to see what our scholars have said about this. We're talking about respect of the parents. Respect your mother, respect your father. Respect your mother, respect your father. For the majority of the time, we're, this, is, this is under your assumption that the parents are actually working together as a team, as they should be, and they're, they're requesting or ordering from the child the same thing. What happens if the mom says one thing and the dad says the other? Which happens sometimes especially as people get older and the children get older and the, the advice and the, you know, gets more, you know, when they're, when they're young, there's certain things like food, bedtime, school, you know, that's pretty, pretty uniform. But then it might be certain things that, no, I, I as the father, I think it should be like this. Now, the advice to the parents is, A, never have that dispute in front of the kids because you want to show, you know, maintain the unified front. And then also don't put your children into a situation where they're confused because to you, you're one, to them, you, we are, as the parents, we're one unit. We're the mother and the father. And one, one example is that like, one thing parents should, should not do is the parents should not keep secrets with the children from each other. So one, one parent should not do something with the children and say, don't tell your mom or don't tell your dad. They shouldn't do that because what's that teaching the, the kids? That okay, there's, 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 room for, uh, there's room for corruption in the government. 
<laughs> right? We can, we can sway one person or we'll, we'll make sure that the request, we'll do the request or the bribe or the nagging, you know, to the parent that we can, we can, we can sway. So uh, what we should do is if the kids say, I want to do this, but don't tell them, say no. If you, uh, if, if you mention something, I'm going to have to tell it to my wife or for the wife, for, for the husband. But in the situation where the parents can't make that agreement and work as a team, and it happens, we're human beings, there's Kidav. There was one, um, I think I might have mentioned it, uh, or, or actually one of my shiokhi um, in Mauritania, actually I studied with him uh, the, the Islamic astronomy and the names of the constellations. And it's very, it's a very interesting science because it helps us even understand aspects of the Quran. We read Surah Yasin, for example, all the time. And then we, need, we read, وَالْقَمَرَ قَدَّرْنَاهُ مَنَازِ the Qamar, the moon, we have put it into manazim. Do we know what that means? There's 28 manazim. And the moon goes on one of each of those. It's the constellations, 28 constellations, and it follows them. So right now, you see the moon out here, and then every night, it's actually rising later and later, if you've noticed that. Like when we go to look for the moon in the east, where do we go? Uh, sorry, in the new moon, we look at the west, right? But where does the full moon rise, and what time? What's that? The, at 14 days, but where in the, the, like when we go to look for the Hilal, for the new moon, which direction are we looking? What's that? West. West. Right after the sunset, right? Now, the full moon, where do we see it rise? In the east, right over there. At the, uh, right, right, almost right at mother, the full moon rises. So, and it's, and it's traveling, and then at the end of the month, the, the end of the moon is also in the east, but at Fajr time, you'll see it. So even just watching that process, Allah is telling us about it in Surah uh, uh, Yasin. If you've ever seen, and we have a lot of palm trees out here. You know when the palm tree comes out of it, there's that, there's that casing that the palm frond comes out of? Has anybody ever seen it? So just look around for the, some of the palm trees, they'll drop the casings. So the, the, the frond comes out of a casing, and the casing will drop off. So next time you see a palm tree, look for that. Look for the casing sometimes on the ground. Especially not the, uh, not the fan palms, but the ones, the, the lawn palm trees. You'll see the casing on the ground. Well, the casing, once it comes out, it's green and it's fresh. Then it dries up and it curls up and it curls around. That's the Urjun. And that's what Allah says. We bring the moon and then it's going to go back to a shriveled up, curved, uh, curved moon. So just understanding those elements of the of the of the tafsir gives us more insight into what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us there. Okay, so uh, Shaykh Muhammad Ali rahimahullah, he taught me the, the, about the constellations. And he said, he used to say one thing. He said, people have khilaf about everything, illa hubb al ta'am, except for food. <laughs> Everybody loves food. That's the one thing that human beings will all agree on. We love food. And look at the hikmah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he came to Medina. What was one of his first executive orders? What's that? He, he did that to Afi. He, brought, he made the brotherhood. But what did he say? Ufshu salam. Give salam. Spread salam amongst yourselves. What else? Wa at'imu ta'am. Feed people. And then he says, And then pray at nighttime while people are asleep. The interesting thing about these, spreading peace, spreading the salam, that's the social communication, you know, bringing happiness to people, having good uh, interactions. It's not just a salam alaikum, because how many of us have gotten salams from brothers, and it's almost like they're buying, salam alaikum. Like, Whoa, brother, it's supposed to be a thing that it engenders brotherhood amongst us. So we have to work on that as a community. Then uh, feeding people. I heard a story from Imam Zaid, he said, remember after Katrina, the, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of people were, uh, homes were destroyed during Katrina. And the first organization, even before the Red Cross, that showed up in those places, this is in 2004, in a lot of those places that the Red Cross would not even enter, was guess, guess which organization? Islamic Relief. May Allah bless that organization and we should all support them and it's wonderful that they're doing work not only overseas but also right here in America. So they were feeding people, bringing bottled water, 
putting people in hotels, paying for people's apartments. They were working in areas, oh, this was the other thing. Red Cross was not allowing any other organization to work except for Islamic Relief. Not other Muslims, no other organizations. That shows the seriousness of how they were, uh, they were running the organization. So Katrina affected Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. My mother's from Mississippi, so when I heard this story, I understood it. One man drove from like a backwoods uh, small town in Mississippi. He had, some of his, his property had been destroyed. He drove down to the distribution center where they were giving out food and uh, gift cards and, and monetary assistance, food, clothes, and so forth, and got some things. And he's coming down, imagine, gravel roads in Mississippi, pickup trucks. I mean, we're talking about backwoods areas. He drives up in his pickup truck, gets this assistance from, from, uh, from Islamic Relief, takes one of their stickers, their bumper stickers, and puts it on his truck, and then drives home. When he gets back to his little town and whatever, wherever he drove from, some guy saw it, and immediately, if you've seen the logo of Islamic Relief, what does it look like? Hmm? It looks like a masjid. Right? There's a, the message with two minarets. And so he said that his friend, of course, being uh, acting racist, being racist, he said, get that off your truck. What's wrong with you? Why are you putting the Muslim stuff on your truck? He said, get it off your truck. He said, no, I'm not taking it off my truck. He said, I'll give you 20 bucks to take it off your truck. He said, no, I'm not going to give it. He said, I'll give you $100 to take it off your truck. He said, I, you, can, you can give me any amount of money. I'm not going to take that bumper sticker off my truck because those people helped me and fed me. So he didn't become Muslim, but you see the power of, of just feeding people? The power of, of, of feeding people and doing actions of, uh, of good work. <clears throat> so in the event, um, I know it's 8.15, I'm able to, if we want to continue the halaqah after, after Salat al Isha, I can stick around. But basically, in the event that the mother makes a request and the father makes a request, now who do we follow? The early ulama, they differed about this. And the main difference came in terms of the, the hadith, you know, when the man came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, who has more of a right over me? For my, you know, uh, uh, who, who has more of a right for my suhbah, for my companionship? He says, ummuka. Then, Ummuka. Then, Ummuka. Then, Abak. Uh, so, four times. So, three fourths of the order goes to, to that. So, in this situation, some of the ulama said, Go with your mother because it's so clear. And Al Jannah to Tahta Abdan al Ummahat. Jannah is under the, the feet of the mother. There's so many ahadith about the mother. She's the one who gave birth to you. She's the one who nursed you. She's the one who took care of you. So forth. Go with, excuse me, go with the mother. Other, somebody came actually to Imam Malik and he wrote to him, he said that he's, uh, he's, he's living actually, he was living in Medina and his father was in Sudan and his father told him, come and live with me. And his mother said, no, I want you to stay here. So now the question comes to Imam Malik. Imam Malik, because a lot of the, the ulama were very careful about what to do, he said, obey your father and don't disobey your mother. <laughs> then he went to another person, Imam al Layth, and Imam al Layth said, No, in this situation, you can't, you, you go with your mother. Uh, but basically, the, the point was that Imam Malik, he didn't give him a quick way out. What do you get from that when he says, Obey your mother and don't disobey your father? What is he telling him? Convince one of them. What's that? Convince one of them to Convince one of them, or? Visit him and then come back. It, it, visit him and then come back. Basically, he's forcing him. Figure something out. I'm not going to give you an easy way out. Like, figure out a way to compromise. But then Imam Lay, who was one of the famous Tabarin scholars as well, he said, he said, well, if you can't make that amends, if you can't make that compromise, then the, then, then go with your mother. So kind of you want to do this. So I'm coming back. Finish up this concept that we were talking about, which is when the parents don't agree. And it's very important to not get into that situation. An interesting thing that we should think about is that this concept of when, when we can't agree and we're going head to head is called tenazum. Just where, where each person basically, neza'a means to pull. So each, pe each person is pulling that, that one way. And we're not, we're not trying to create this utopia where everybody agrees. One of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put into his creation is pushback. 
people push back on various things. And what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about this in the Quran? If it were not for the fact that Allah is pushing, now how is He doing this pushing? People amongst themselves. Literally, and it's Allah. It's like the, pu the pushing. And in English we say, oh, He's giving you pushback on that. So Allah is telling us about this, that this element of pushback, He has put this in His creation and put he human beings, this, 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 um, uh, independence, so to speak, that once they feel like, oh, I think this is the way it should be doing, they give pushback. That's part of our uh, 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 endowed nature. That's what Allah wants us to do. So we're not going to try to turn into people who just, yes sir, yes sir, you know, to our parents. That's not what, also when we talk about bitter wadi day, we should be thinking about that. Do we want to create children that all they do is, 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 uh, is, is give obedience? Or do we want them to, to train them to know how to give pushback, but respectfully? Because this bitter wadidin is not about complete obedience to our parents. It's about respecting the parents and giving pushback respectfully when we say, no, sorry, we can't, I can't, I can't do that. With all due respect, and you're still my mother. And yeah, Abati. It's like uh, uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he spoke to Azza. Azza was an idol worshiper, and he told him to, to do shirk. And he told him, yeah, Abati. My father, I can't do that. The same way he spoke to him was the same way Yusuf salam, spoke to his father, who is a prophet and a messenger, the son of a prophet and a messenger, the son of a prophet and a messenger. Yusuf, the son of Yaqub, the son of Ishaq, uh, the son of Ibrahim. Salam. So, so we have to have this pushback, and this is something that Allah has put, uh, put in creation. Um, this goes, and. And what's the alternate? That if people don't do that, what? The The earth would have been corrupt. Just think about in your in your workspace. If everything goes in the workspace, are you going to have a successful company? No, you have to give pushback. No, I don't accept that. In a business dealing, if you go into a business dealing, you have to you have to give some pushback, and that pushback is part of nature. But that pushback is different than tanazur, where we're just pulling and tugging at each other. And what does Allah tell us about tanazur in the Quran? Wala tanazaru. Don't do tanazur. What would happen if we do tanazur? What's that? Fatashan. You will, you will um, fail. Fail. Fail is the word. You fail and وَتَذْهَبُوا Right? And then your spirit, you lose your spirit. So don't get into this like, so push back, yes, Allah is telling us that's part of the that's part of the, the, the creation. That's how we're maintaining balance and order in society. But at the same time, we don't want to do tanazur, where we're just tugging at each other. So push back, that's good in healthy in a relationship. But tanazur, it's going to you're going to fail, and your strength and your ruh, your spirit will 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 will, will leave. So that's in the parenting, uh, in, the, in the parent team, the, the mother and the father, they should realize that. Pushback, yes. Tenazur, they, they have to be you know, be careful. Especially now because if we're teaching our children, respect your parents, obey your parents. Now when the two parents are indifferent and they make that apparent to their child, you're going to, we, we would put our children in a serious predicament. Because now they're like, what do I do? I want to please Allah, I want to please my father, I want to please my mother, and now I have to choose between one or the other. So that's where this ruling comes in. Imam Malik is saying, obey your mother and don't disobey your father. Basically figure a way out. Well, the man went because he realized, okay, I understand what he's saying. Like try to figure out, but well, what happens in the event that I can't figure out a way? He went to Imam al Saadi and Imam al uh, gave him a fatwa based on the hadith, your mother, your mother, your mother. He said, go, go with your mother. So we understand that. But for us as parents, for those of us who are parents, especially, I mean, we're here, we're, we're uh, fathers, we also have to remember that if we have this pushback, and even if it turns into tanazo, that that we should be thinking about sometimes letting certain things go because this is the mother. Like, do we want our children? Do you want your children to obey you in, in the situ in the situation where you and your wife are not agreeing on a point? Do you want your child to do to disobey you or your wife? But don't think about it as, oh, disobey me or disobey my wife. Do I want my child to disobey his mother or disobey his father in that situation? Like, let's not even get into that situation. 
But if it comes to it, what do we want to do? What, what do we want as men? What do we want to do when it comes to like with our mother? Are we going to go above and beyond the call of duty for our dad or for our mother? Our mother, right? That's what we want for ourselves. That's what we're doing. So we have to think about that for our children. So in the situation where there is that pushback, and maybe it turns into Nazareth, you have to sit back and think to yourself, okay, well, the end result is I'm going to put my children in a predicament, and I actually want them to do bitter wadi name. So if we're going to be completely honest, say we don't move away from our position, say, look, this is my position, but obey your mother. That was that's where we're sincere with our deen. We're saying, I'm not giving up my position. And I'm not going to, this is still my feeling, but now I'm going to actually, instead of demand that you obey me and demand that you, and put you in that predicament, I'm going to say, I'm going to give up and I'm actually going to change because I don't want you to put. And this whole process might even be happening and they don't even see it. And that's actually the better thing. But in the event that they do see that, that, uh, that we realize this is what the ulama have said, uh, said about that. Because there's many, many hadith about the, the, the mother. I mean, just think about the hadith that we hear. Is it mostly the mother or mostly the father? The mother. And who's really gone through a lot more trouble? The mother or the father? The mother. It's like sometimes uh, when, uh, when, I, you know, uh, when, when people have a, uh, uh, a new baby, I'll ask the, the fathers, so, so you're sleeping well? You're sleeping okay? Because <laughs> usually the one who loses sleep is the mother, right? The dad loses sleep sometimes, but it's usually the mother. So, so that's what they said about the, 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 the section of uh, Tanazor. Then we'll go into another um, related uh, section, which is, um, it's basically, it's a continuation of this. Who, which of them has a greater hub, bigger right over you, your mother or your father? So we talked about Tanazwa, but now we talk about which one has a, uh, a, a greater greater right. And they said, again, with this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu saying, your mother, your mother, your mother, this is a very strong proof that you go with, you, you know, you go with your mother. But Imam Hassan al-Basri, who was one of the Tabi'een, one of the greatest Tabi'eens, and the Sayyid of the Tabirin, the leader of the Tabirin, he was such a righteous man, they said when he would walk into the marketplace, people would do istighfar when they saw him. And they would do dhikr of Allah when they saw him. And this is the sign of a true sheikh, of a true spiritual person, man or woman. The spiritual person, when you see them, they remind you about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what was happening when Hassan al Basri would walk into this marketplace. They would see him and they would immediately think Allah. Now they're not doing any type of worship thinking of this person. But when they see this person, it, he reminds them of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's in such a good connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he reminds them of them. So that's what uh, and Hassan al Basri, we can go on. If you're not familiar with his seerah and with his, with his story, look into... Um, uh, uh, because he met Sahaba, he was a student of the Sahaba, and he's one of the main bridges between the generation of the Sahaba and the, the Tabi'een. And he was well, not only a, a Tabi'i, uh, a, a person from amongst the Tabi'een, but he was a scholar from amongst the Tabi'een. So he was at a, at a very high level of knowledge and a very high uh, level of, um, uh, of taqwa. And he had his own madhab. So there's, there's, there's four codified methods that we have today in Sunni Islam, but there, at that time there were actually other methods as well. I mentioned Imam Layth, he had his own madhab. And Hassan al-Basri had his own madhab. There were multiple uh, authority also uh, had his own uh, madhab um, because they were, uh, were mujtahideen. So and Hassan al-Basri was asked, which of the parents have a, a greater right? So look at what he says. Again, going with, you know, thinking about what Imam Malik said, do you obey your mother or your father? He said, don't obey your, uh, don't uh, obey your mother and don't disobey your father. Meaning like, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to be the one who's going to make this decision for you. So somebody asked Hassan al-Basri, which of them has a bigger right? And he said, The right of the father is grander, but the right of the mother is more obligatory upon you, or more uh, demand, elzam, um, what would be a good translation for elzam? Uh, more uh, pressing, what's that? Obligatory? 
more obligatory, more pressing upon you. Like more, it, it requires that you follow that more. So again, isn't that almost like a riddle? The father's right is greater, but the mother right is more obligatory. And what I take from this is that he, again, he's, he's saying, if a person starts thinking about this, what should I, you know, who should I be giving more respect and honoring and obedience to? He said, just, it's, it's not a simple matter. The father has a grand right, a'lam, and the mother has a, uh, is, is enzim. Um, now we can go and philosophize on what, what exactly this means, but what a practical, a practical application of this, the scholars have said, at the level of obligatory obedience to our parents and respect, uh, uh, the bid al waridin that's a fard, that's an obligation, your parents are equal. So don't think that I should be obeying my mother, you know, giving more, some of these things that we went over, more respect to my father or my mother. We're saying no, at the level of, of obligatory, it's the same. They only differ in, in when you choose to do extra. When you're thinking about the extra time that you spend. And for most people, when they think about the, the, the time that they spend and the, the service that they give, most of the time it's with it's with their mother. They give more concern, more conversations with the mother, more time with the mother, more the extra. When you're going above and beyond the call of duty, give precedence to your mother. That's what this hadith is, is trying to stress. But in that situation where now we're faced with two obligatory matters, your father is going to be angry if you don't follow him here, and your mother is going to be angry if you don't follow her in this, then you give precedence to, to the mother. So I'll end there. The next section, which is now another practical, is how, what happens if our parents order us to not get married or to not get married to a specific person. And I think that's a very common issue in all societies, the parents not being in agreement with the decisions of their children for marriage and so forth. So we'll discuss that next week and mention some, uh, some cases uh, some situations amongst the Sahaba where their parents were not happy with the marriage that they had made. Also a case where Ibrahim السلام, was not happy with a marriage that his son Ismail السلام, had made. And so we'll go through those, but just to end in the last 10 minutes, if there's any questions about on this topic of Bidr Wadidin, whether it's this week or, or previous week. Okay, this might not be PC, but I'm hoping it's a safe space. Okay. Ah, very good question. Ah, very good question. Isn't the mother supposed to follow the father, and the father is the leader of the family? This principle, and I heard it just somebody just a couple days ago, says, you know, in the Muslim household, the man is the head of the household. The problem with this statement is that there's a lot of ambiguity about it. And so where do we clear up the ambiguity? We go to the Sharia that has very specific rulings based on the understanding of our scholars who are doing ijtihad according to the Qur'an and the Sunnah and if they can't find something directly from there using usuli principles, principles of the juristic methodology to figure something out sounds like they're having a good time over there, right? Um, and so people have this concept that the wife has to obey the husband the father and the household in everything now I know there's children so I'm going to use some code words um, According to the Shafi'i school, and according to Imam Shafi'i school, there's only two things that the wife has to obey the husband in. Just two. That's it. Intimate matters. And not leaving the house without permission. Now that doesn't mean every single time she leaves. It just means she knows that he has, he can, he can basically uh, veto a decision she makes. But if she knows generally he's, he's okay with me going to the store, going over here, going to my work, going to this, then that's fine. But that's the two rights, that's it. If the wife picks up a book, she wants to read a novel, and the husband's like, I don't want you reading that book. She does not have to obey him. There's no method that says that. In the Hanafi school, or I don't want to speak on the, the Hanafi, in the Maliki school, it's those two matters, plus basic maintenance of the house and his needs. like. Basic cooking, basic cleaning, the, that, that's it. That's it. So that's where the husband is the leader of the household. Everything else, if she says, if she wants to take up a hobby, if she wants to take up uh, something else, if she has a decision, you know, other thing. So it's, it's not as the man is the, the leader of the household. Now, we can get into like specific situations like, 
some of the, a lot of these would be easily vetoed by the rule of you can't leave the house without my permission, right? So it's like, oh, I want to go to this museum. No, I want to go to this museum. Well, you know what? I'm the father, and I'm saying we don't. Nobody leaves the house. <laughs> In what sense? Could you give like an example? Like say schooling. Yeah, schooling or oh, or. Affects children. It's not about the lady specifically. That they share. And, you know, what about like sports? Like the father wants the kid to play a certain sport, the mom's like, he's gonna get hurt. Okay, that's a, the, the dad wants him to play a certain sport, the mom's saying he's gonna get hurt. Um, which, as an interesting yeah. side note, you know the roughhousing dads do with their kids, both the men and the women? You know what that's very important for? It develops emotional regulation in children. Because how many times do you rough house with your kids and then it goes a little bit too far and they're like, ah, oh, they start crying. You're like, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, right? And because uh, we've all done that, right? As dads, we've all gone too far. But what is that teaching them? That's teaching them like, like okay, even if somebody makes a mistake and you know you want to feel like you cry or scream or just want to, you, you have to train them how to, uh, uh, to, to uh, so I, I just, when I read that article, I was like, subhanAllah, I asked other dads, moms don't do it. Any moms, anybody know moms that rough house with the kids? No, but dads do it just naturally. Nobody has to teach you. Remember how we were talking about a couple of weeks ago about the natural things that Allah has put in place into our body? Dads just naturally rumble, tumble, hit the kids, right? Even parents who do not physically reprimand the children. When it comes to roughhousing, right? You're like, come on, let's move along. But it's, it's in the mad Your intention is not to hit them, and they're understanding that. They're building up the ability to say, like, oh, okay, he's hitting me, but it's in play. It's not, he's not angry. Um, and then if I get hurt, okay, I can just just brush it off. Let's 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 move on, or or whatever it might be. So, but that's what I was saying. Like if the, if the dad wants them to, you know, do a sport, then they might get hurt. In that situation, um, a lot of the tarbiyah of the child is the 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 the, the obligate is the father's obligation to give tarbiyah to the child. They both in terms of education. So when it comes down to education, it's actually the father's. That's his. That's his right. Um, so, I mean, I think it, you know we're getting into like a fifth discussion of, of, of the nitty gritty. Hopefully, we're keeping this just theoretical at this point. Because if it gets if if the relationship gets down to that point, that's when they actually should speak with somebody. Actually, in my book, Good Wadi Day, in a lot of these sections, I say if it's a practical, real situation that you're deal, dealing with, speak with a person who's well-versed in the Sharia to understand your specific situation, what's going on, and help you resolve it. Because we can't just say, oh, the, the, the father's right, absolutely. It really would have to do, it's, it's case, case dependent. It's um, like we've got this unfortunate, we come from, a lot of people like, have us come from authoritarian, authoritarian uh, parents, from authoritarian Regimes. Yeah, and that's how it goes down to the family. The family becomes an authority because they grow up. They kind of grow up like that, and you think that's that's the trauma. But then you can take it too far in another direction, and you have to have the direction. Yeah, no, there has there definitely has to be the authority, and the father at, at some point he has to be able to use his veto power. And so, like saying, at the end of the day, the person who's the head of the household in that sense, the person who can stop everything, say like, okay, you know, we got all these going and comings, we're doing all these extra things, but at the end of the day, if we want to shut down operations and everything has to be approved, like say, for example, the wife wants to uh, do a, a master's degree program. She can choose whatever uh, master's degree, but it has to be with the husband's permission to leave the house. Now, if it's online, he can't stop her. So say she wants to do a master's in literature. And he's like, no, I don't think you should do that. I don't want you. Well, it's not a. She's not leaving the house. It's online. She she can order the books. She can pay with it for her own money. You see what I'm saying? But if she has to leave the house, he can't stop her because he doesn't like the subject matter that she's studying. But he can't stop her because he says, I'm the man. I have the right for you, you know, to, to, to not leave the house. But if the relationship is at a point where it's such that he's having to use that veto power all the time, then it's not a healthy relationship to to. <clears throat> this is like a uh, from a previous uh, session okay. um, and not a hypothetical one. It actually happened some 13, 15 years ago with me. So my mom is there and my kids are there, so I'm in between. I'm a father and a son too. So you're saying you have, uh, 
you have your mother and then you have your children. Yes. Yes. So, I, I, and this is in a perfectly nice atmosphere. So my my kids say to me, uh, me and my wife. So when are you guys going out? And my mom says, you call your parents guys. So I am like thinking well, it because okay because it is hurting her. She yeah. thinks it is lack of other. Uh, we think that it is closeness. Yeah. There's another side. So the question is basically, he was saying, uh, Brother Azhar was saying that he, he's at a point where he has children himself, but he also has his mother. So now he's in the middle, right? He has Biru Wadidin going one way, and then he's expecting Biru Wadidin from his children. And his children uh, refer to uh, their parents as, when are you guys going out? They said, you guys. And the mother said, how do you let your children, you know, her grandchildren, right, say, refer to you as guys? And that's, again, goes back to culture and the parent's preference. If the parent is okay with it, it's not a book in that situation. It's not disrespect. But here's, and he's going to talk about the, uh, the rights of the, the grandparents, you know, better what again as it relates to the grandparents. But this is a situation where even though, like, if you're okay with your children saying guys to you, so they're not doing a book, but your mom can use her veto power and say, I don't like that. So I can't order them because they're my grandchildren, but I can order you to, to not accept that from me. So, um, so that's a situation where, you know, the, the check and balance. And, and actually, has anybody seen that where, where, you know, you're the authority for your kids, but when your mother or father comes around and your kids see that dynamic of like, oh, wow, mama and baba, actually, there's a, there's a power above them. Have you ever seen that? They yes. love that. I actually asked my kids one time, I said, how do you like it when you see my mom, you know, uh, like check me and say, don't do that, don't do that. This I said, do you like that? We like to see that. Uh, so that's some of the check and balance there. We'll do one more. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, sure. So basically, yes, it's it's okay. It's not a uh, but basically she can. Buy it. So there's certain things that maybe you can tell your kids, like, look, I'm okay with it, but when we're around, the, you know, my mother just just was out of respect for her. Yeah, it, it actually didn't get to that. It, it's just that I told my kids. Uh, the not to say that in front of their yeah. grandma. <laughs> okay, so you already, you naturally you knew the answer. Yes. <clears throat> yes, so there, he says, does it, does it cover the bit of, when the parents have passed away? And he does have a section on that. Any other questions? Great. Okay, so the, the, next week is the last week when Isha will be 8.15, so we'll start before Isha, 7.45 or so, and then pick up after Isha. But then after next week, Isha is at 8 o'clock, and so the halakha will be directly after uh, Isha. And the last announcement I'll make, if there are any fathers who would like to volunteer with the, with the boys program, even on like every couple of weeks, it doesn't have to be every single week, we're looking for more volunteers, so please reach out to uh, 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 me through my email, rami at mccespain.org.